The Catholic's Ready Answer by Rev. M. P. Hill The Church of Christ? How to find it? Objection If the true Church of Christ is still in existence, the claimants to that title are so numerous that the problem of finding the Church is beyond the powers of any but extraordinary minds. The average man might be excused if he gave up the search. The answer. The problem is not so difficult in itself. It is often made difficult by the way in which it is approached. Christ established a church that could be recognized by all men, high and low, learned and unlearned. Go ye into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. These are his words. And when he added, He that believeth not shall be condemned, he implied that to recognize the truth was possible, and more than possible, for otherwise the refusal to do so would not incur damnation. But the acceptance of the bare teaching of the gospel was not enough. The teaching was to be enshrined in a church, an organized society, to whose rulers' obedience was to be due. Christ speaks of building a church, that is to say, of founding a permanent organization for the guidance of men to salvation. He enjoins obedience to it in such words, as he that will not hear the church, let him be to thee as the heathen and the publican. The sacred writings abound in allusions to a church or assembly of believers, governed by the apostles or those appointed by them. A church, too, about entering or not entering, which there could be no question. To belong to it was a universal obligation. Conditions for Solving the Problem The obstacles preventing one from getting at the truth about the church vary, of course, with the individual. There are persons who feel a sort of fascination in merely skirmishing with the subject, and generally, in merely playing with religious ideas. Religion is an interesting subject. Mystery is always alluring. And in our age, there is a tendency to speculate about religion, much in the spirit in which Dr. Johnson says the Greeks were wont to do. That is to say, without much sense of personal religious obligation. But such is not a spirit that pervades the New Testament. In the mind of Christ, religion has a practical aspect which cannot be dissociated from it. A right mode of worship, a working out of one's salvation by the aid of religion, a submission to divinely appointed authority in the church, one true church, as is plain. All this was an essential part of the plan of salvation to which Christ came to give effect. There is no choice left us but to use the means of salvation which he has provided. As he equipped the apostles and their successors with extraordinary powers, even that of binding and loosing, and that of opening and closing the gates of heaven, and commanded all men to hear them, He that heareth you, heareth me, and he that despiseth you, despiseth me. The possession of such authority would be absurd if men might at pleasure submit or refuse to submit to those who possessed it. Membership in the church presided over by the successors of the apostles is therefore a matter of the strictest personal obligation. And for those who are not yet among its members, the duty of inquiry and of prompt and generous action is one of the most pressing nature. Before or after one has begun his inquiry, he may be hampered by another obstacle, prejudice, especially inherited prejudice, or that instilled in early childhood prejudice that tends to block out all inquiry in certain directions in which it is taken for granted that the truth cannot be possibly be found. Many a convert to the faith has been kept out of the fold of Christ by prejudice, the greater part of his life. Whenever there is a question of putting oneself in an order established by providence or of personal salvation, which is the same thing, 
the closing of any avenue by which truth may reach the mind involves a risk which no man has any warrant for taking. Another obstacle lies in the complexity of the problem, a complexity, however, which is not of its essence. The solution is difficult because it seems to be a matter of deciding between hundreds of sects, all of which are denominated Christian, or of shifting from one sect to another till the right one is found. The problem must be simplified, and so simplified that a key to its solution may be put into the hands of all. The church, we must repeat, is a church that may easily be recognized by all, for to all the gospel was to be preached. The church must, therefore, possess distinguishing marks which can easily be recognized. The Marks or Signs of the True Church The necessity of some marks or notes by which to distinguish the church is acknowledged by Protestants as well as by Catholics. While the notes set forth by Protestants may be shown to be impracticable as guides. Protestants tell us that the true church is to be found wherever there is a right preaching of the word of God and a right administration of the sacraments. Now this double criterion is clearly delusive, not only because it fails to distinguish the church from its schismatical bodies, but also and chiefly because these two supposed notes of the church are practically no notes at all, that is to say, outward visible marks which are easily distinguished. They are facts, it is true, to anyone to whom they can be proved to be facts, but they are not signs or marks which can be matter of direct observation. Sermons and rites are of course observable facts, but the rightness or wrongness of sermons or rites is not an observable fact. If I am told, therefore, that any given religious sect is known to be the one true Church of Christ by the fact that it preaches the gospel aright and administers the sacraments aright, my answer at once is a challenge. Prove that such is the character of its preaching and of its sacramental system. I have asked for a sign and am given instead a proposition that needs to be proved. The Catholic Church, on the other hand, insists on the application of tests which are more ready to hand, but which nevertheless are infallible. The notes of the Church to which she appeals are supplied by the Nicene Creed, which is accepted by the greater part of Christendom. The true Church is one, holy, Catholic, and apostolic. Here we have four distinguishing traits which, comparatively speaking, are easily discerned. The Church possessing them cannot easily conceal them. Unity and Catholicity, or universality, will be manifest to the average observer. Holiness in ends, means, results cannot long lie hidden. As to apostolicity, or the Church's descent from the Apostles, if any worldwide Church possesses it, the fact will be written legibly on the pages of history. Now the Roman Catholic Church is the only Church to which these marks either singly or in their totality belong. In the first place, there is prima facie or first sight evidence of their belonging to the Church of Rome. The Old Church, as everyone calls it, conspicuous for its unity, spread throughout the world. It is anything but narrow or national. And exerting a special power and influence for good, does not this sound like a description of the Church of Rome? And in what other church does the presence of these traits show itself on the very surface? Here then we have a point of departure for the inquirer. The claims of the Roman Catholic Church merit first consideration. Just as in physical science, first indications all pointing one way have the first claim to the attention of the investigator. In the course of this study, the inquirer will be led to see that the old church is the veritable church of the apostles 
by reason of the continuity of its tradition, that its unity is perfect and could only have been preserved by a special providence, that its holiness is greater than at first sight appeared, and is due mainly to the preservation of the divine element in its ministrations, and that in its character of a world religion, it is as universal as the merciful designs of its divine founder. The inquirer will now be ready for a more particular study of the notes as possessed by the Roman Catholic Church. Apostolicity What is the origin of the present hierarchy of the Catholic Church? That is to say, of the graded ministry consisting of the Pope, the Patriarchs, the Bishops, the Priests, etc. It takes no profound knowledge of history to see in the present hierarchy the lineal descendants in a spiritual sense of the Apostles in their immediate successors. In each successive age, we find the hierarchy of the time safely anchored in the past. Each diocese could exhibit the unbroken line of its spiritual rulers from the beginning. In the earlier centuries, heresies were triumphantly refuted by the application of the touchstone of apostolic succession. We have it in our power, said Irenaeus in the second century, to enumerate those who were by the apostles instituted bishops in the churches and the successors of those bishops down to ourselves. The same boast is repeated by Tertullian in the third century and by others in successive ages down to the present. It is conceded by all that the present hierarchy of the Catholic Church is in a direct line of descent from the apostles. The acknowledgement of this fact is a matter of the first importance. For undoubtedly, if the question is which of the churches is the one true Church of Christ, a church whose succession of teachers and rulers can be traced to apostolic days must possess an immense advantage in the discussion as compared with any church not possessing such perfectly visible links connecting it with the beginnings of Christianity. And now let us apply the test of apostolicity to the other churches. How can they possibly establish any connection with the apostolic age? Lutheranism began with Luther, a self-commissioned preacher who succeeded for a time in making his opinions acceptable to his followers. A similar origin is that of all the evangelical religions that have sprung up since the first half of the 16th century. We gather from the sacred writings that a preacher must have his credentials. He cannot preach unless commissioned to do so. How shall they preach unless they be sent, asks St. Paul, writing to the Romans. No one can preach in Christ's name unless commissioned by Christ himself, as the apostles were, or by those who have received their authority from him. Hence the necessity of a succession of commissioned preachers, each receiving his authority from another, and all tracing their commission back to Christ himself. How shall they preach unless they be sent? What answer then can be made to the crucial question, who sent Luther, Calvin, and Zwingli to preach? And above all, who could have sent them to preach a doctrine at variance with that universally taught in the Church of Christ? Is there any meaning in being sent if the one sent preaches what he pleases? The truth is that the whole doctrine regarding the necessity of the preachers being sent was virtually repudiated by the self-constituted reformers of the 16th century. They took the bold stand of preaching a doctrine opposed to that of the church, although it was only from the church they could have received a commission to preach at all. Did they fancy they were sent directly by the Holy Ghost? If so, what manner of credentials did they bring with them? St. Paul was sent by the Holy Ghost, but his credentials were well certified. His mission was revealed to the church. He conferred with the other apostles about his teachings and taught the same doctrines as they. 
the Reformers' Commission from the Holy Ghost had no such certification. Furthermore, the idea of apostolic continuity includes much more than the bare fact of succession in office. Otherwise, the occupant of an Episcopal see, though he turned Mohammedan and preached Mohammedanism, might still claim to be a successor of the Apostles. The faith and practice of the Apostles must also be handed on to posterity by the occupants of the seas. If the rulers of God's Church in the 20th century do not stand for all that the Apostles stood for in point of teaching and ministry, the note of apostolicity is gone. It is conceivable that a bishop duly consecrated and given local jurisdiction should lapse from the faith and use his office in the interest of heresy. In that case, apostolic succession would be a body without a soul. Jurisdiction, no less than orthodoxy, would necessarily cease, and true internal succession would be no more than a name. And if such a bishop would consecrate another to be his successor and to propagate his heresy, the status of the latter would be like that of his predecessor. This is plain common sense, as well as the teaching of the fathers. Now if this be the case, there must be in the Church of Christ a criterion of genuine internal apostolic succession. And our contention is that the only church possessing any such criterion is the church which acknowledges the jurisdiction of the See of Rome. It is precisely by and through this universal jurisdiction, wherever it has been acknowledged, that orthodoxy has been preserved and the faithful have been given a security that they were under the genuine successors of the apostles. It is not our purpose at present to establish the claims of the Roman primacy that we have done elsewhere in this volume. And after all, we are dealing only with the face of apostolicity, which constituted a mark or sign of the true church, easily discernible by the many. The Roman church is the only one that has any recognized criterion of apostolical succession, whilst the other churches have absolutely none. According to the Anglican view, apostolicity in the church consists of a number of separate streams of apostolic succession, each flowing in its own channel, and never unless accidentally brought into conjunction with the others. Whereas from the apostolic age onward, the mind of Christendom has conceived of the apostolic church as an organic whole, symbolized, according to St. Paul and the Fathers, by the living human body, whose members are made one with the head. What possible criterion can Anglicans have in the matter of teaching and jurisdiction? Even if Anglican orders were valid, do orders confer local jurisdiction? If so, where is the proof of it? When the first Anglican bishops forced themselves out of the framework of the ecclesiastical polity in which their predecessors had been for ages, what guarantee could they give their flocks that they wielded apostolic authority? The voice of all Christendom was against them as it is today. The Pope, whose supremacy their predecessors had acknowledged, repudiated them. There was no foundation in Scripture for their anomalous position and henceforth, the veriest of heretics. If he succeeded in getting some genuine bishop to place his hands upon him, might usurp the government of a diocese in the name of Christ and his apostles. If opposed by the Anglican authorities and required to answer the question, where did you get your jurisdiction? He might with justice ask them in turn, where did you get yours? Historically, the Anglican system has borne its natural fruits in its evolution of doctrine and worship. Anglicanism embraces today every form of teaching, from Roman Catholicism, or something akin to it, to the various Zwinglianism, and from Zwinglianism to Unitarianism, or worse. But its formularies and its prayer book are sufficiently elastic to be made to cover every vagary 
of the Anglican mind. The case of the schismatical churches of the East is scarcely better than that of Anglicanism. For more than eight centuries, their standing before the rest of Christendom was assured by the one bond of union which united them with all the other churches in the primacy of the See of Rome. Today, severed from the center of unity, they seek in vain for a rallying point of orthodoxy. What is to be thought of apostolical teaching and jurisdiction in churches which for centuries acknowledged the supremacy of the Pope, then renounced it, again, on two separate occasions, embraced it, once more, renounced it, till finally they lapsed into a state of bondage to the secular power, which has been the latest stage of their downward course. It is evident, therefore, that the Church presided over by the Pope is the only one possessing the note of apostolicity. It is apostolic because its bishops are the true successors of the apostles, and because it has a principle of unity which is the only guarantee of apostolic succession. Unity Unity and apostolicity, though differing in idea, are nevertheless so intimately connected that the one cannot exist without the other. As true apostolicity includes the transmission of the doctrine and practice in all essential matters of the apostolic church, and as that church was one and undivided, a church which possesses the note of apostolicity must be one and undivided in its teaching, its worship, and its form of government. Perfect unity was an essential element of the design which our Divine Lord carried into execution when He instituted the Church. For this unity He prayed, and the prayer of the Son of God could not have been made in vain. Holy Father, He prayed, keep in Thy name those whom Thou hast given Me, that they may be one, as we also are. And not for them only do I pray, but for them also who through their word shall believe in me, that they all may be one, as though Father in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. As the prayer of Christ must have been heard, there still exists a church which exhibits such unity, a unity the model of which is that which subsists between the Eternal Father and His only begotten Son, a unity the possession of which by the Church is a sign that it was founded by one who was sent by the Eternal Father, that the world may believe that Thou hast sent me. There must be in existence at the present moment a Church which is one and undivided in belief, in worship, and in corporate life. The one church possessing such unity is not far to seek. The only church which exhibits this triple unity is the church properly called Catholic, the church in communion with the See of Rome. Its unity is, indeed, the despair of its enemies, many of whom, unable to copy it, have imitated the fox in the fable by decrying it as pernicious as shackling human liberty, and as an obstacle to human progress. The Roman Catholic Church possesses a unity which is the necessary consequence of its having a center of authority, from which radiate a power and an influence which unify the exceedingly varied human elements of which it is composed, a unity which is at once inimitable and indestructible, and both of these qualities proclaim its divine origin. If it were of human invention, it would have been overthrown long before today. But this principle of unity is as strongly entrenched as ever and continues to win adherence to the Church from the ranks of those whose forefathers, a few centuries ago, abandoned it. If it were of human invention, the human mind could produce some imitation of it whereas the unity of the Catholic Church is simply inimitable. It has no parallel in any human society 
religious or secular. The unity of the Catholic Church is, of course, incomparable with absolute freedom of thought in matters religious. When a point of doctrine is explicitly set forth by Holy Writ, or when it is clearly defined by divinely constituted authority, the only rational course to be followed by the human intellect is to bow in submission to a higher authority than itself. Just as in purely mundane matters, one mind will accept the judgment of another better informed. But outside the circle of truth thus revealed or defined, there is a vast field opened to human speculation, one indeed in which the brightest intellects have ranged untrammeled for centuries. In this connection, however, there is one essential difference between the Catholic Church and all other religious bodies. Controversies may arise about matters as yet undefined, but the parties in each dispute acknowledge the Church's power to settle the question at issue and accept beforehand, with full interior assent, any decision which the Church may deem it advisable to give. The recognition of such authority is the one great condition for the realization of the unity for which our Lord prayed to His Eternal Father. It is all but needless to show how this truly Christian unity contrasts with the imperfect unity, or rather the absence of unity, that characterizes the sects. No sooner has any part of God's Church discarded the principle of unity and severed itself from the main body than at once discord begins to appear and sooner or later reigns supreme. Authority is superseded by opinion and opinion varies with the individual mind. We must leave it to the impartial judgment of our readers to say whether such a state of things was contemplated by the divine founder of Christianity. And yet it is not rare to hear Protestants maintain that among themselves there is unity in essentials and disagreement in non-essentials. But if you ask them which doctrines are essential and which are not, you will find that few Protestants will give the same answer. Even doctrines once regarded as essential by all Christians, the divinity of Christ, for instance, have in recent times lost their hold upon countless minds within the Protestant pale. Religious belief has been left to the chance working out of human opinion, and gradually opinion diverges and sects multiply. The very cornerstone of Protestantism, the Bible, has lost its place of honor, and the crumbling of the fabric erected over it is proceeding apace. Catholics, on the other hand, are fully entitled to use the distinction between essential and non-essential, for they have in their midst an ever-living voice of authority, which decides today, as it decided in the first assembly of the apostles in Jerusalem, which teachings are essential and which are not. Catholicity or Universality The mission of the apostles was to the entire world, and the mission of the church is the same. Hence, she can place no limit, geographical or racial, to the exercise of her ministry. You shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the uttermost part of the earth. These words are at once mandatory and prophetic. They enjoin the universal preaching of the gospel and predict the fulfillment of the injunction. In penetrating to every part of the earth, the church is, of course, dependent on time and on geographical discovery. But she would be unfaithful to her mission if she did not strenuously endeavor to extend her field of action. And Christ's promises would be unfulfilled if the church were not actually found in every inhabitable and accessible place on the earth. The term Catholic or universal was variously applied by the fathers of the early church, but the meaning most commonly attached to the word was that of universality of place. Such ubiquitous presence was always regarded as a test whereby the true church of Christ was to be distinguished 
from its counterfeits. Heretical bodies were identified with particular localities, and against them, appeal was made to the church that was known the world over, and also be it added to the one unvarying doctrine which it everywhere taught. For this oneness of doctrine is an essential element of Catholicity regarded as a note of the church. If the church, whilst extending itself geographically, changed its teaching, extension would be a virtual multiplication of churches. The greater the extension, the greater the number of the sects. What we shall look for, therefore, is a world church, a church which is actually spread throughout the world, and a church which is everywhere the same. Now which of the churches answers this description? Can there be two possible answers to the question? Of the missionaries of the Catholic Church it may be said, as was said of the apostles, Their sound hath gone forth into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the whole world. At no period of its existence has there been a known part of the earth unvisited by them. They have followed hard upon the footsteps of the explorer. Nay, not unfrequently has the apostolic man been in the very van of discovery. Columbus, the greatest of discoverers, was no less an apostle than a man of the sea. The labors and the success of our missionaries have won the enthusiastic praise even of our enemies. The black robe among the North American Indians, the Jesuit of the South American reductions, the saviors and the riches of the Orient have become household words among ordinary readers of history. In comparatively recent times, seven million Filipinos have been won to Christianity and civilization. Even in China, where the spread of the gospel has met with almost insuperable obstacles, the success of the French missionaries is the despair of their Protestant rivals in the same field. And who has not heard of the work of Cardinal La Vigere and his white fathers in preaching Christianity and aiding in the destruction of the slave trade in the wilds of Africa? The significance of these facts is that the Catholic Church has the same universality of outlook as the Divine Master when he sent his disciples to preach the gospel to every creature, and that in every age she endeavors more and more to realize the ideal of absolute universality which every true Christian must have at heart. And if we ask the further question, which of the churches is actually established everywhere and is the same everywhere, the same answer is supplied by facts which all the world knows. If anyone wishes to realize the ubiquity of the Catholic religion, let him place himself in imagination in the Vatican and endeavor for a moment to look abroad upon the world with the eyes of the present sovereign pontiff, Benedict the Fifteenth. His children are found in all the countries of the globe. There is not a corner of the earth to which his jurisdiction does not extend. There is not an island in the remotest seas from which some ecclesiastic may not be wending his way ad lamina apostolorum to lay the burden of his cares at the feet of the common father. St. Paul's solicitude for all the churches, for the various parts of one in the same church, was necessarily great, considering the number of foundations that claimed his care. But what would be his solicitude if he were at the head of the entire church today? And what glowing descriptions of the kingdom of God on earth would he give in his letters if he could look beyond the pillars of Hercules and see the countries of a new world whose steaming populations looked to him for guidance and assistance. If the extent of the Pope's dominion be expressed in numbers of souls subject to him, it is no less impressive. Nearly 300 million human beings, belonging to every clime and speaking in every human tongue, and yet a unit in loyalty and obedience to a common father. The more varied the membership of the Church Catholic, 
the greater is the wonder excited by its perfect unity in belief and practice. Such perfect unanimity cannot have a human origin. Any attempt to explain it by any purely human or other natural cause must prove utterly futile. The only valid explanation is to be found in the promise, I am with you all days, even to the consummation of the world. And now let us apply the test of Catholicity to those bodies of Christians which have separated themselves from the Sea of Rome. The sterility of the Eastern churches is almost proverbial. Schism and heresy have produced their effect in paralyzing apostolic zeal. The churches of the East will always be the churches of the East. The local brand will always distinguish them until one day, as we may hope, they will range themselves among the loyal subjects of Christ's vicar on earth. And what shall we say of the Reformed churches? After 400 years' existence, the barrenness of Protestantism in the field of missionary labor is only too evident. With unlimited resources, what has it accomplished in the newer countries of the world? What are its conquests? What nation has it brought within the pale of Christianity? The geographical extension of Protestantism has been due almost entirely to the migration of Protestants from their ancestral homes in Europe. In an age in which anything that may be transported on wheels or by water may be given some sort of universality, it is not surprising that Methodism or Presbyterianism is in some manner represented in the four quarters of the globe. But in many places, the sects are little more than represented. Protestant missionary enterprises, as compared with Catholic, have been egregious failures. Even where Protestantism has extended itself by reason of the accidents of time, its unity, such as it is, has been proportionately impaired. When Anglicanism or Methodism or Presbyterianism transplants itself to a new country, its new habitat will sooner or later give it a new name and a new creed. In the beginning of its history, Protestantism securing the patronage of certain potentates in Northern Europe succeeded in forcing its creed upon whole countries, but its native feebleness was demonstrated wherever it was brought fairly into competition, on anything like equal terms with Catholic zeal. In the first years of the Reformation, Protestantism was in a fair way to possessing the whole of Europe. But soon an army of saintly and energetic Catholic missionaries entered the field and the work of conversion, says Ranka. Advanced with resistless forces and vast provinces were covered to the faith. Fifty years after the Lutheran separation, says Macaulay, Catholicism could scarcely maintain itself on the shores of the Mediterranean. A hundred years after the separation, Protestantism could scarcely maintain itself on the shores of the Baltic. Even today, in every country in which Protestantism once dominated, the tide of Catholicism is steadily advancing and the forces of Protestantism are steadily retiring. But the decline of Protestantism is not due solely to the progress of Catholicism. In the northern countries of Europe and in America, a species of internal decay has been consuming the religion of the masses of the population. Over the entire world, it is true, a wave of irreligion has been passing in recent years, but the Catholic Church is the only power that effectually opposes its progress. The other churches can scarcely get a hearing from the multitudes who are infected by it. In the United States alone, between 50 and 60 million people own allegiance to no religion and seldom or never cross the threshold of a church. Of this enormous multitude, the majority are of Protestant antecedents. And yet, Protestants can still boast of large numbers. 
but their numerical strength, such as it is, loses all its significance when their numbers are severed from unity. Who can estimate the real strength of Anglicanism or of Calvinism when any Anglican or Calvinist may in his secret heart believe as he pleases? With Catholics, it is different. Outward profession and numerical strength need comparatively little discounting when taken as an index of genuine Catholic faith. All this being the case, the actual numerical strength of Catholics in the world possesses no little significance. The Catholic population of the world, which before the advent of Protestantism was about 100 million, is today close upon 300 million. And of this number, a large percentage is the fruit of apostolic zeal, either in civilized or in barbarous countries. And what is more, this numerical strength has been developed during a period which has been mostly one of persecution. We have said more than enough to show that the Church in communion with Rome is the world religion which the religion of Christ was intended to be, that everywhere in the world it is found to be the same and always true to itself, and that it exhibits an unequaled vitality of apostolic zeal which constantly tends toward the realization of that perfect and absolute universality which was in the mind of Christ when he sent the apostles to preach the faith throughout the world. It is the only church, therefore, entitled to the name of Catholic. Holiness As the church is the creation of the Son of God, it should partake of the holiness of its founder. It possesses a guarantee of holiness in the promise of Christ. Behold, I am with you all days, even to the consummation of the world, and in the assurance that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. For if it were not holy, it could not withstand the attacks of the evil one. The church must be holy in its teaching, in the means it employs to sanctify its members, and in its actual sanctification of them. As regards personal holiness in the members of Christ's church, it is evident from the Gospels that Christ foresaw that many would not respond to his generous designs in their regard. Men's wills would be free, and many would abuse their freedom of will and refuse to avail themselves of the means of salvation so bountifully provided for them. It must needs be that scandals come, he said to his disciples. He foretold that iniquity would abound, and that the charity of many would grow cold. Nay, before the close of his own life, two of his twelve apostles, one-sixth of the whole number, sinned grievously, the one through weakness, the other through overruling passion. And afterward, even during the lifetime of the apostles, the beauty and the glory of Christ's church were marred by schism and the grossest of vices. The inquirer must not then be misled by a false criterion. He must not be surprised if he find tears among the wheat and vice in the near neighborhood of holiness. He must distinguish between the church as a divine institution and the church as an aggregate of individual men. Once we have mastered this distinction, we can turn to the church as a divine institution and as entrenched in the divine promises with the expectation of finding in it a reflection of the holiness of him who founded it. We shall expect in particular to find in the church 1. A loyalty to moral standards and principles. 2. An effectiveness in teaching and enforcing the divine law. 3. A preservation of the channels of divine grace. And 4. A sanctification of souls on a large scale. Now what church can stand a comparison with the Roman Catholic touching the first two of these points? There is no need of going far afield to discover what lies at our doors. 
Our own country furnishes an object lesson on the moral influence of Catholic teaching. Here in the United States, in the present perilous conditions of morals, what power or influence, or if you will, what public institution can be thought able to cope with the moral corruption that is advancing upon us like a deluge? Will some faltering voice suggest Methodism or Presbyterianism or Anglicanism? The weak influence these institutions have upon individual consciences in the present augurs ill for their influence in the future. What we need is not sermons or Bible lectures only, but an institution that shall retain a firm hold on the traditional principles of Christian morality and at the same time use effectual means of promoting morality. What church can bear comparison with the Catholic in the guardianship of principles making for the moral welfare of society? The peace of families, the sacredness of the marriage bond, the religious education of the young, religion as the foundation of morality, where will any of these vital interests find in future generations an uncompromising defender except in the Church of Rome? After three centuries or more of competition between the two rival systems of religion, the American public may now judge of the practical worth and the true intrinsic character of the system based upon private judgment, and compare it with a religion which speaks and acts with a consciousness of divinely given authority and refuses to surrender its principles to the spirit of the age. More than half of the effectiveness of the Church's ministrations lies in what is called the sacramental system, which the Church teaches is of divine origin. In the sacraments, there is a special embodiment of the truth uttered by our Lord. Without me, you can do nothing. God's grace is absolutely necessary as a means of salvation. Without grace, it is impossible to overcome any grievous temptation or even to persevere for any considerable time in the practice of the purely natural virtues. Hence our Lord, through the Church and by the means of the seven sacraments, meets every human need in the moral order and is ready with His assistance at every important turn in the journey of life. Through the sacraments, a divine power is infused into the soul, and with it, the germ of stability and perseverance. It was a bold step that was taken by the reformers when by their simple fiat they destroyed what from time immemorial had been regarded as divinely appointed channels of grace. The destruction of the system was followed by its natural consequence, a lack of religious vitality in the great mass of reformed Christians. The divine nutriment once supplied the soul was now withheld and spiritual depletion was the result. Some of our Protestant readers, whose surroundings may be exceptionally edifying, will doubtless be offended at our implying that in point of vital religion, Protestants are inferior to Catholics. But with all due regard for Protestant feeling, the belief is not an unfounded one. We are not to judge by the few, but by the multitude. It was to the multitude that Christ preached, and a church's influence on the multitude must be one of the tests of its Christ-like character. Will it be maintained that the sects have a hold upon the multitude here in America? Are they aware that we are confronted with a nation of indifferentists and agnostics? Are they ignorant of the influence of godless schools on practical morality? And all this and much besides, in a country that was once the paradise of Protestantism. In contrast with this state of things, of the 15 or 16 millions that make up the solid Catholic phalanx, the great majority are effectually and practically influenced by their vital connection with the Church, and especially by their reception of the sacraments. There is absolutely no comparison between the religious devotion of Catholics and that of non-Catholics. 
their churches are filled, not only when attendance at religious services is of strict obligation, but frequently when it is not. And in nearly every church, hundreds are seen at dawn assisting at the sacrifice of the Mass, and again, on weekday evenings, attending the services of their sodalities or other such associations. Thousands are active promoters of the apostleship of prayer, a really great instrument for the sanctification of souls. As regards the ordinary duties of life, the influence of the sacraments cannot, of course, be brought home to the mind of anyone outside the pale of the Church. Catholics know it and feel it. Non-Catholics often see its effects but are unable to trace them to their cause. In the case of the sacrament of penance, however, of the effects produced, one at least is fairly well known. A condition for the reception of the sacrament of penance is the renouncement of every species of dishonesty and the restitution of ill-gotten gains. Indeed, the renouncing of every vicious habit of a serious nature is a condition for receiving absolution from one's sins and admission to the reception of the Holy Eucharist. As regards to the interior effects of the sacraments, which are best known to those who experience them, the most effective appeal we can make is to the testimony of those innumerable converts who have felt a new light and strength entering their souls with the grace of the sacraments. One of the ripest fruits of sacramental grace is the desire to embrace what is known as the way of the divine counsels or the way of complete renunciation. Readers of the New Testament must remember how on one occasion a young man came to our Lord and asked him what he must do that he might have life everlasting. Our Lord, naturally enough, bade him observe the commandments. But when the young man said he had observed the commandments from his boyhood and asked what was still wanting to him, the Lord answered, If thou wilt be perfect, go sell what thou hast and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. Such is the way of the counsels, the giving up of all, to follow Christ the more perfectly. Are all our readers aware that this life of special renunciation has nourished in the Church in every period of its history? Are they aware that today those who follow this manner of life may be numbered by the hundred thousand? They have heard of the religious orders of the Catholic Church. They have heard of their work of charity. Perhaps they have heard of their apostolic zeal, the great bulk of the work of converting the heathen has been accomplished by the religious orders. But not all who are acquainted with this particular face of the religious life are aware that the success of religious in external labors is rooted in the most absolute self-renunciation, consisting not only in the sacrifice of material treasure, but also in the immolation of the flesh and the will by the vows of chastity and obedience. It is needless to decant on the contrast between the Catholic Church and the other churches in the matter of the councils. Attempts have indeed been made to naturalize the conventional life among non-Catholics, but they have only emphasized the need of its being planted in more congenial soil, and of this the latest proof has been given in the accession of whole communities of Anglican religious to the Roman Catholic communion. It is plain that one important feature of Christian holiness is lacking in non-Roman religions. And this brings us to another, though not essentially different, aspect of the holiness of the Church. In the Church of Christ, which appearing as it did after the twilight of type and prophecy might be supposed to exhibit the noonday brightness of the reign of grace, one would expect to find some souls nay, even very many of the course of ages, whose lives would show forth the transforming power of divine grace in an extraordinary degree. And who are these but the actual saints of the Catholic Church? Not only the canonized saints, 
but many besides whose memory will never be thus publicly honored. No age of the church has been without them. Even in the 16th century, when the general decline in morals gave some color to the revolt against the Church of God, the number of canonized saints alone would be a surprise to our separated brethren. What has Protestantism, or what have the sects of the Orient, to show in comparison with this galaxy of saintly men and women? Far be it from us to belittle the virtues in many cases, the superior virtues of those who do not share our faith. For the realm of grace is, after all, not strictly commensurate with the limits of the Catholic Church. Even pagans and infidels are not totally deprived of the divine assistance. But were we to ask for a list of men and women of world-renowned sanctity, it is difficult to see from which of the Reformed religions it would be forthcoming. Let them endeavor from the worthies of the 16th century, or from those of any century, or from all the centuries, and from all the sects to match a list which comprises such names as those of a Savior, a Philip Neri, an Ignatius of Loyola, a Pius V, a Charles Borromeo, a Francis Borgia, an Alfonso Rodriguez, an Alfonso Liguori, a John Berkmans, a Peter Claver, a Stanislaus Koska, an Aloysius Gonzaga, a Cajitan, a Teresa, a John of the Grocer, to come closer to the present generation, a Perboire, a Vianney, a Don Bosco, a Clement Hofbauer. But the attempt will, of course, never be made by anyone who knows what is meant by a Catholic saint. But there is yet another feature of the Church's holiness, which is the most distinctive of all though it shows itself more rarely than the others. The special presence of the Holy Ghost in the Church is attested by the miraculous power conferred on at least a few in each age, and in the wonders wrought in places hallowed by the devotion of the faithful. When our Lord commanded His apostles to preach the gospel in the whole world, He made the following predictions, And these signs shall follow them that believe, in my name they shall cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they shall drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay their hands upon the sick, and they shall recover. That these signs did follow, we are told in the Acts of the Apostles. That miracles, having wrought since the days of the Apostles, is the testimony of reputable historians. But we are not wholly dependent on the witness of past ages for our belief in the continuance of this mark of divine favor in the Church of God. Miracles are worked probably on as grand a scale as ever before in the history of the Church. Miraculous healing of the most astounding kind has been wrought at the famous Grotto of Lourdes in France. Diseases pronounced incurable. Diseases of an organic nature, fractures, lesions, tumors, cancers have been cured, often instantaneously and under the eyes of numerous witnesses. Official records of these events have been kept and have been submitted to the scrutiny of medical experts. There is nothing in nature to account for these wonders, and they are all connected with devotion to the Blessed Virgin under the title of Our Lady of Lourdes. There is an extensive literature bearing on these wonderful occurrences, and information on the subject is within the reach of all inquirers. But our aim just at present is not precisely to prove that miracles are actually performed. Our contention is that, as our Lord promised this mark of His favor, to the preaching of the word, as he did not, apparently, place any limit to the period of its continuance, and as it is probable that signs of his presence and power, which he bestowed even upon the Jews of old, would be continued in the church which he came on earth to found. The church which can present at least so much prima facie evidence of miracles 
and still believes in miracles, is more likely to be the true church of God than any church which shows no signs of miraculous intervention and even discards a belief in miracles. The question here is, which of the churches bears the greatest resemblance to the Church of Christ and His Apostles, in this, as in every other indication, of holiness? And now we have almost brought to a close this exceptionally long article on a very important subject. We have endeavored to describe the marks by which the Church of Christ is to be recognized. These marks, we have contended, should be of the most conspicuous kind in the case of a religion that was to be preached to the entire world, and these marks are found only in the Church which acknowledges the supremacy of the See of Rome, in the Catholic Church rightly and distinctively so called. Any Church which fails to present the same credentials is not the Church of Christ, and consequently not the Ark of Salvation even though it preserves, as many churches do, some elements of ancient faith and piety. It is possible that one or other point in the above argumentation may not at once produce conviction in the mind of the inquirer. We would ask him, in that case, to look at the argument as a whole, and then ask himself in all sincerity whether any such case can be made out in favor of any church but that of Rome. If none can, there is no doubting the conclusion that a church that exhibits so many signs of divine favor and of divine preservation must be the Church of Christ and the one only Church of Christ, and that consequently, as our Lord made the acceptance of the true gospel, or in other words, membership in His one and undivided Church, a condition of salvation, the practical step to be taken will easily suggest itself to any logical mind. Church B. As Mediator Objection The Church thrusts herself between Christ and mankind, and yet Christ is our one mediator with God. Nonetheless, the Church has lost the world-subduing power she once possessed. The Answer the Church does indeed stand between Christ and mankind, but she has not thrust herself into that position. She has been assigned it by Christ himself. It is not in the power of man or of the Church herself to change that which Christ has established. Christ appointed St. Peter the visible head of his flock, John 21st, and hence Peter stands between Christ and the sheep of Christ's fold. Christ, sending forth his disciples to preach, said to them, He that heareth you, heareth me, and he that disposseth you, disposseth me. Luke ten sixteen. If thy brother shall offend against thee, tell the church, and if he will not hear the church, let him be to thee as the heathen and the publican. Matthew eighteen fifteen through seventeen. Plainly, then, the Church is in the place of an intermediary between Christ and mankind. Christ is our mediator with the Father, undoubtedly, but the Church is our mediator with Christ. It is from the Church of Christ that I must receive the teaching of Christ, as well as the means of grace which He has provided. Such was the intention of Christ. Going therefore, teach ye all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Matthew 18.19 He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be condemned. Mark 16.16 16. It profits nothing, therefore, to be willing to adhere to Christ if one is not willing to adhere to the visible church of Christ and to be led to Christ through the church. The capital error of Protestantism is that it denies the necessity of adhering to the visible Church of Christ. But there is another objection to be met. It is a superficial one, however. The Church, we are told, has lost her world-subduing power. She once converted whole nations in a comparatively short time. We hear of no such conquests nowadays. Meantime, the nations are falling away from her. 
The objection is superficial because it is based on a few striking passages in history, such as the story of the conversion of the Franks under Clovis. The objector, looking in vain in modern times for a parallel to such events, concludes that the church no longer advances on her triumphant march through the nations. Yet the church's work proceeds apace now as in former days. The conversion of nations in the past was, as a rule, slower than in some time supposed. It took centuries to convert any one of the northern nations. Today there is no apparent diminution of zeal in the church's missionaries. In all probability it is attended by no less success. The Catholic missionaries in China have enormously distanced their Protestant rivals in the same field. According to the China Yearbook for 1914, the Catholics of the Empire number 1,363,697 baptized Christians and 390,985 catechumens, or those preparing for baptism, whilst according to the same authority, the 90 societies and agencies engaged in Protestant mission work in China report only 167,075 baptized and 157,815 catechumens. Confer the month, January 1914. In British India, in Ceylon, there were in the year 1911 as many as 2,226,449 Catholics. The figures for British India are furnished by the Indian government census confer the month September 1913. The most significant fact in connection with these missions is that in 24 years there was an increase of 1,102,022. Few records of missionary success in the old days can match those of the Catholic missions of Uganda and Africa, where the number of the catechumens in five or six years rose to 200,000, the conversion of the Filipinos to the number of 7 million has been the work of Catholic missionaries in recent centuries. In many of the more civilized countries of the world, the Catholic faith has been making steady progress. This is true even of Germany, the birthplace of Protestantism. The Catholics of the Empire form considerably more than a third of the population, and their steady numerical increase is a source of dismay in the evangelical camp, which cannot help noticing the gradual decay of religion among the Protestant masses. But dismay should not, at least for one reason, be the feeling engendered by Catholic success. For if it were not for the Catholic Center Party and the Imperial Parliament, the Socialists, with their atheistic and materialistic tenets, would today be the rulers of Germany. Socialism, we may add, is recruited chiefly from the Protestant working classes. Among the educated classes in England, it is no longer a reproach to a man to be Catholic. The past 70 years have marked a return on a large scale of the people of Great Britain to the faith of their fathers. During that period, the Catholic population has more than doubled its numbers, showing a total at the present date of more than 2 million. In the United States, there are more than 15 million Catholics, and a large percentage of the number is made up of converts from Protestantism. The instruction of Protestants applying for admission into the church is a well-known feature of parish and city mission work. Can it, then, be true that the nations are falling away from the church? Even if it were, it would be no new experience to a church that has reached the good old age of 1900 years. Centuries before today, she lost large populations in northern Africa and in the east, but then, as ever after, she turned to new fields of conquest. Since the revolt of Luther, she has trebled her numbers. Four centuries ago, there were 100 million Catholics. Today, there are close upon 300 million. But is it not true that the Church is losing her hold upon the Latin countries of Europe? No one can regard, with more concern than Catholics, the extent to which unbelief and the neglect of religion have spread in those countries. Though the same is true of Protestant countries, Germany 
in the United States, for instance. But there is one feature of the situation in the Latin countries which must not be forgotten. Religion in those countries has in it a principle of self-renewal, which is at work today as it has been in the past, resuscitating what is dead and putting new life into what is decaying. Religion has passed through more than one great crisis in France, and that it is passing successfully through its latest crisis is evidenced by the astonishing growth of Catholic activities which has recently appeared and which is noted as significant by the secular press, and that too, notwithstanding, nay partly in consequence, of persecution suffered at the hands of an infidel government. During the past 400 years, and notably during the 19th century, we might say, without much fear of exaggeration, that scarcely a decade has passed in France, but some choice fruit of Catholic zeal or piety of worldwide value and importance has been produced by this good old Catholic stock. Today, more than half the religious institutes, whose members are daily seen wending their way through our streets on some mission of charity, or are devoting their lives to the training of the young in our schools have sprung up in the Catholic soil of France. In Protestant countries, on the other hand, it is precisely the absence of any self-renewing source in their religion that casts a gloom even upon the social and political prospects of those countries, in which a license of unbelief and an atheistic form of socialism are so rampant is it not true, and are not rulers of those countries, like Germany, aware of it, that the one great barrier against atheism and anarchy in those countries is the solid phalanx of the Catholic body? The Catholic Church still lives. It shows no signs of decay, save those who are ignorant of the real facts of modern history. The Church and Salvation Objection Catholics are taught that outside the Church of Rome there is no salvation. It is a poor recommendation of the Roman religion that it sends the majority of men to eternal perdition. The answer. The formula, out of the Church there is no salvation, is indeed familiar to Catholics, and moreover has a recognized place in Catholic teaching, but for the most part it is misunderstood by non-Catholics. Certainly, from the earliest Christian ages, the truth has been enunciated in the Church of God that membership in the visible Church, established by Christ, is a necessary means of salvation, and according to Catholic teaching, the one true Church of Christ is the Church, which is in communion with Rome. This is the appointed way of salvation, and no other has been revealed. But is there no way of salvation? open to those who, through no fault of theirs, are not convinced of the claims of the Church of Rome. That we dare not assert. God's providence extends to all his rational creatures. He has given them the light of reason. He has written the precepts of the natural law upon their hearts. He does not leave them unassisted by his grace. And under providence, no one will ever be lost for not knowing truths which he has had no means of learning. If a direct and categorical answer be required to the question, is it possible for one not in communion with Rome to be saved? Our answer is, yes, it is possible. But it is possible only in cases in which the persons concerned may be said in some sense to belong to the church, though not consciously and avowedly in communion with it. Catholic theologians draw a distinction between an explicit and an implicit adherence to the Church of Christ, between what one explicitly holds and professes on the one hand and what is implicitly contained in his disposition of mind and heart in regard to the necessary means of salvation. Persons who have no means of learning the truth but are living according to their lights and are willing to use all necessary means of salvation, may be truly said to participate, according to their needs, in the grace communicated by Christ to mankind through the Church. In this sense, they are members of Christ's Church, and to them, 
The dictum, out of the church there is no salvation, does not apply. Many non-Catholics are known to feel a keen personal interest in the question we are discussing, and of this number perhaps the majority finding themselves in a state of mental unrest regarding the means of salvation. Take comfort from the thought of that. After all, one may be saved without entering the Catholic Church. Now persons of this class cannot afford to be indifferent to the conditions on which they may be saved, especially as set forth by a church which dates from the apostolic age and which, as they themselves acknowledge, opens a way to salvation. These conditions are clearly stated in an encyclical letter addressed by Pope Pius IX to the bishops of Italy, August 10, 1863. Whilst insisting on the necessity of seeking salvation through the Church, the pontiff says, It is known to us and to you that those who are in invincible ignorance, i.e. ignorance which they have no means of dispelling, of our most holy religion, who observe the precepts of the natural law which God has written in the hearts of all men, and who in their willingness to obey God live an honest and upright life, may, by the aid of the divine light and grace, attain to eternal life. For God who beholds, searches, and knows the minds, the hearts, the thoughts, and habits of all men, in his sovereign goodness and mercy, does not permit any one to suffer eternal punishment who is guiltless of a willful transgression of his law. Here it is distinctly taught that it is possible for a non-Catholic to be saved but saved conditionally. The conditions are these. 1. That one has no means of knowing and recognizing the true Church of Christ. In our day, it is to be feared that many seek a refuge in ignorance when ignorance might easily be dispelled by inquiry, study, and prayer. 2. That one shall not have offended God by any grievous sin, or, we may add as implied, that having so offended God, he shall have duly repented. Acceptable repentance, in this case, must be based on perfect contrition, that is to say, on a sorrow for sin, which has for its motive the love of God for the sake of his infinite perfections. Any one who turns from his sin and turns to God by an act of love may be saved, provided he does not afterward turn away finally and forever from God. After what has been said, it ought to be quite unnecessary to remark that non-Catholics ought to be much less concerned with finding or inventing reasons for remaining where they are than with honestly and earnestly inquiring after the truth, being determined at the same time to embrace the truth wherever or whenever found. If they think they may be saved outside the Catholic Church, they should be careful to ask themselves, but how? If one who has not the truth is bound to seek it, those who have it are bound to impart it to those who do not possess it. It is possible for a non-Catholic to be saved, but nevertheless it is God's will that the truths of the Catholic faith should be made known to him. If a non-Catholic has neglected to find the truth, he will be lost and hence every opportunity of enlightening him should, with all due discretion, be improved. Moreover, although a man may be saved in honest ignorance of the truth, nevertheless his salvation is endangered by the absence of the many graces he would obtain through a knowledge and practice of the true religion. Protestantism has impoverished the spiritual lives of its adherents by drying up the wells of sacramental grace, which are filled to overflowing in the Church of Christ, and from which all its members may draw according to their needs. Among Protestants, the holy sacrifice of the Mass is abolished, Christ is banished from the tabernacle, the souls of men are no longer nourished by the true body and blood of the Lord. Grievous sin no longer finds a healing power in the sacrament of penance. The dying are no longer comforted and strengthened in their last journey by the Holy Vatican or by the last anointing. 
in their struggle with the world, the flesh, and the devil, non-Catholics, find their spiritual nourishment reduced to the minimum, and no wonder that so many of them give up in despair. Add to this that so many Protestants are living in a state neither of light nor of darkness, but in a sort of twilight of doubt and uncertainty, which they have it in their power to dispel. This unenviable condition of our separated brethren, it is our bounden duty to relieve. Communion under one kind. Objection. The cup of the Lord is not to be denied to the lay people, for both the parts of the Lord's sacrament, by Christ's ordinance and commandment, ought to be ministered to all Christian men alike. 39 Articles of the Church of England. Article 20. The answer. The Catholic Church would be the last institution in the world to deny the people anything in her gift that would conduce to their spiritual profit. If she gives the faithful the Eucharist only under one kind, it is because she is obliged by circumstances to withhold the chalice from the laity. But at the same time, she neither infringes on any ordinance of Christ our Lord, nor deprives the faithful of any essential benefit which the sacraments was instituted to confer upon them. But what are these prohibitory circumstances? They are, in general, circumstances connected with the reverence due a sacrament in which our Lord Jesus Christ is as really and as substantially present as he is in heaven at the right hand of the Father. If our non-Catholic readers would appreciate to the full what we are going to say on the subject, they must endeavor to realize that Catholics sincerely believe that under the appearance of wine is present, in the most real and literal sense, the precious blood of our divine Savior. If the contents of the chalice were given to the laity, they could not give, at least as a rule, in a manner consistent with reverence. Hence, the partaking of the chalice is permitted only to the priest during the holy sacrifice, which is offered in the name of both priest and people. As we shall see later, communicants are not thereby deprived of any essential benefit conferred by the sacrament. But what are the circumstances in question? Catholics certainly can easily imagine them. Fancy a parish of ten thousand souls for whose Sunday worship provision is made through six or eight masses, rapidly succeeding one another from dawn to midday. At each of these masses, when the signal is given, an army of communicants is seen approaching the altar rail. Time is precious, and Holy Communion must be given expeditiously, though with decorum and according to fixed rubrics. Imagine a chalice, filled and refilled and filled again, out of some common receptacle on the altar, with constant danger to its precious contents, or at least to some small portion of them. The danger of accident, or of irreverence, increases, of course, with the number of communicants among whom there are so many, whose oddity of manners makes it difficult to administer communion, even under the species of bread. Like enough, some portion of the sacred blood would remain unconsumed, and would have to be preserved in the tabernacle amidst the other sacred vessels, which are used daily. How it would tax the priest's care to preserve that chalice, with its contents, from all manner of accident. In meantime, the sacred species would be growing vapid or sour. Furthermore, many of the communicants would have a natural aversion to the taste of wine. Others would not be able to retain it. Not a few would feel repulsion to drinking from the same cup as others, in some cases from a reasonable fear of infection. These apprehensions are not fancy bread. They are the fruit of the actual experience of the church and the administration of the Eucharist under both kinds. They have been felt even in non-Catholic congregations, where they have been the subject of very serious discussion. An additional difficulty is experienced by some in our day arising from the fear that the use of wine in the communion service may beget the habit of intemperance. Leibniz, the distinguished philosopher and theologian of the 17th century, 
who labored long but unsuccessfully for the reconciliation of Protestantism and Catholicism, says of his own time, There are some Protestants who admit that if a person have a natural abhorrence of wine, he may be content with the communion of bread alone. System of Theology, page 121. Doubtless, some of the Protestant denominations of today would abolish their present practice if it were not for the fact that communion under one kind formed the subject matter of some of their original articles of protest against the Church of Rome. When the Reformers first came upon the scene, communion, under one kind, was in actual possession. Why did they abolish it? They retained so many other things which they had on the sole authority of the Church, and without a word of authorization in Scripture, that we ask with a natural curiosity and surprise why they did not retain communion under one kind on the same authority. Leibniz reminds his co-religionists of their inconsistency. I have no doubt, he says, that those who are in authority have power to make laws in such matters as these, and that the faithful are bound rather to obey them than to give rise to a schism, which St. Augustine shows to be almost the greatest of all evils. Indeed, the Church's power of defining is very extensive, even, though this is only in a certain way, in things which belong to positive divine law, as appears from the transfer of the Sabbath to the Lord's day, the permission of blood and things strangled, the canon of the sacred books, the abrogation of immersion in baptism, and the impediments of matrimony, some of which Protestants themselves securely follow solely on the authority of the Church, which they despise in other things. Ibid, page 124. They abolished communion under one kind and gave the chalice to the laity. One of the principal reasons alleged for the change was that communion under both kinds was a matter of divine ordinance and commandment. But where do they find the ordinance and commandment? Surely not from the famous sixth chapter of St. John's Gospel, whose bearing on the Eucharist Protestants as a body will not acknowledge. For the sake of the comparative few who do acknowledge it, it let us remark that although in version 54 our Lord does say, Except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you shall not have life in you. A rigorous interpretation of the words in favor of the ultraquists logically require a like rigor in interpreting another verse a little lower down. He that eateth me, the same also shall live by me. Here the effect produced by the sacrament is promised to those who eat his flesh. The drinking of his blood is not mentioned. Surely then the substance of the ordinance, formal or implied, should be observed by receiving communion under the species of bread. But perhaps there is a general ordinance in the words, Do this in remembrance of me. But not even here is the practice enjoyed upon the faithful in general. The words are addressed to the apostles, and through them to the priests of the church, but not to the people. As the priests were to offer the sacrifice, and as this required the species of both wine and bread, both were to be consumed by the priest. The principle, indeed, the one essential reason why communion under one kind is deemed sufficient for the faithful at large is that Christ our Lord is present, whole and entire under the species of bread just as he is under the species of wine. There is not, nor can there be, any physical separation of the blood from the ever-living body of Christ. Consequently, Christ, whole and entire, must be present under either species, and as it is he that is our sacramental food and drink, we receive the whole of our spiritual nourishment by receiving the sacrament under the appearance of bread. So much for the Eucharist as a sacrament. As a sacrifice, on the other hand, both elements are necessary for the full significance of the sacrificial rite. Hence the apostles and their successors and the priesthood are obliged in the sacrifice of the Mass to consecrate both elements, and as the communion is an integral part of the Mass to receive both. Finally, the present practice of the Church 
as the sanction of ancient usage, although very naturally it was primitively the custom to give Holy Communion under both species. Still, there is abundant evidence of the fact that in the first centuries the faithful were allowed at times to receive under the species of bread alone. They were in some cases permitted to take the consecrated species home to their houses, to be there preserved and received. The sacred host was also sent to the prisons of the martyrs. Infants were also allowed to receive Holy Communion, but only under the species of wine, a custom still surviving in the Greek church. These facts of ancient usage are not denied, nor can they be denied, by any one who has even an imperfect acquaintance with early church history. One would suppose they were entirely unknown. So little impression do they make, even upon those who profess a reverence for the primitive practice of the Church of God. According to the opinion of the Protestant Leibniz, the question of communion under one species is a typical case in which authority is needed to decide what is of divine ordinance and what is a matter of ecclesiastical discipline. Confession Divinely Instituted Objection It is not in the power of the Creator to forgive offenses committed against the Creator. Hence, confession, in which the priest presumes to pardon sins, cannot be of divine institution. The Answer The power of absolving sins was conferred by Christ on the apostles and on their successors in the priesthood. This doctrine is based on Scripture, and both the doctrine and the practice are as old as the Church of God. The doctrine and the practice of the Reformers were a new novelty when first introduced, and that fact alone should awaken deep reflection in every sincere and open-minded adherent of the Reform. Novelties in religion are always to be suspected, and as regards in the religion of Christ, novelties in doctrine are necessarily errors when condemned as such by the teaching authority of a church which received so many promises of divine aid. Luther, it is true, retained confession in his new system of religion, but repudiated the pardoning power of the priest. His denial of this power was an innovation, was condemned by the church, and, as we shall see, was contrary to the plain and obvious meaning of the very words on which Luther based any doctrine on confession. In these words, our Lord plainly tells his apostles that they have the power to forgive sins, and Luther had no warrant for destroying the literal and obvious meaning of the words, especially on the inspiration of his own private and personal experiences. For after all, were not Luther's personal experiences, his Heilserfahrungen, as they have been styled, the origin of the new doctrines? See Justification. A direct proof of the Catholic doctrine on the remission of sins is found in the 20th chapter of John's Gospel, verses 21 through 23, where the evangelist is narrating a vision of our Lord after the resurrection. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them, and he said to them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost, whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven them, and whose sins you shall retain, they are retained. Still simpler powers, including the remission of sins, are conferred by the following words, Matthew chapter 18, verse 18. Amen, I say to you, whatsoever you shall bind upon earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you shall loose upon earth shall be loosed also in heaven. The first of these passages furnishes a demonstration of the principal points of the Catholic doctrine. This we shall endeavor to show in the following comments. 1 whose sins you shall forgive. The word forgive can have but one meaning, and the meaning should be obvious. The word cannot mean, as the Lutherians maintain it does, merely to declare that the sinner is forgiven in heaven, in virtue of his renewing the faith of his baptism. When we say that a person forgives, we do not mean that he declares that someone else forgives. The act is his own. In the present tense, it is true, the act of forgiveness on earth must be ratified by an act of forgiveness in heaven. But that is guaranteed by the promise and institution of Christ. Whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven them. Which is equivalent to saying, the sins forgiven by you are in very truth forgiven, because they are at the same time forgiven by God. In other words, God graciously regards the act of His minister and representative 
as though it were his own. The word forgive, moreover, must have the same meaning in the two clauses of the sentence, whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven them. And as true forgiveness is meant in the second clause, it must be meant in the first. But in so far as the forgiveness is the act of God's minister, it derives all of its efficacy from divine institution and divine ratification. Most Protestants are turned from the Catholic doctrine on confession by the strong repugnance they feel to the idea of a man's wielding powers which can only belong to God. But they should remember that the power to forgive sins is only a delegated power. The confessor really and truly forgives sins, but always in the name of God. This appears in the very formula of absolution pronounced by the priest in the confessional. I absolve thee of thy sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. It is not in his own name or by his own underived authority that he absolves, but in the name and by the authority of God. He absolves in virtue of a commission received from God. Just as a king might commission a high officer of his realm to pardon outlaws whenever he found the offenders repentant and ready to make satisfaction for their crimes, so God can appoint the priests of his church to dispense his mercies to sinners when they are found to be in good dispositions. It cannot be denied that God can delegate one of his creatures to extend pardon in his name to his fellow creatures. His absolute power to do so is not repugnant to our Christian idea of God and his attributes. The absolving power does not raise man to a level with God, since man absolves only in virtue of a commission from God. It does not make man the absolute judge of the dispositions of his fellow men, for God alone knows the heart, but it does empower him when he sees the ordinary signs of contrition in the penitent to dispense the grace which God has attached to the sacrament. In this, as in other matters, he is one of the dispensers of the mysteries of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. If the sinner who confesses does not truly repent for his sins, the absolution of the priest is not ratified in heaven. The wisdom of God in bestowing such power on his priests is manifest in the results produced by its exercise and in a way in which it responds to the cravings of the human heart. The effects of confession have been acknowledged by many of our separated brethren. See Confession and the People. Not, of course, that they have any experience of such confession as practiced in the Catholic Church, but in those who have had such experience that they are aware that such effects are produced, whilst the great gap in Protestant life caused by the absence of confession is brought painfully home to them. The divine wisdom is shown in the provision made for the unburdening of the heart, especially in regard to matters which are the heart's own secrets and will not be communicated to anyone except under circumstances guaranteeing peace of mind and perfect security. It is shown also in the fact that God has associated the reconciliation of the sinner with an external rite of religion, and one, too, that bears a special stamp of divine authority. Repentance, however sincere, if locked up in the heart, cannot breed the peace and tranquility experienced by the penitent when he hears the words of absolution which fall upon his ears as though they had descended from heaven itself. The divine wisdom is manifest also in the restraint put upon the sinner by the obligation of confessing his sins. 2. The power to forgive sins extends to all sins, whose sins you shall forgive, etc. No sins are excluded, and by the force of the words, all are included. If any sins confessed with the proper dispositions could be denied forgiveness, our Lord, it must be presumed, would not have worded His solemn commission to the apostles in so general a form. Hence, His words cannot refer to the remission of sins in baptism and consequently only to sins committed before baptism. For a sin would be committed after baptism, that too must fall under the powers of the keys. The Church, from the earliest centuries, has taught that no sins were accepted when the general power of absolving were conferred on the Church. The Montanists of the second century were condemned as heretics for maintaining that the Church had not the power of absolving from grievous sins. The Novatians of the third century fell under the same ban for restricting the power of the Church as regarding grievous sins. Moreover, on this and on other essential points relating to confession, the Oriental sects agree and have always agreed with the Catholic Church a fact which proves that in the early centuries, before East and West were divided, the present Catholic doctrine was that of the universal Church. 3. 
The power conferred upon the apostles was to be transmitted to their successors in the priesthood. The immediate recipients of the power of absolving and retaining sins were the apostles alone, for to them alone were the words of our Lord addressed. But the power conferred on the apostles was to be perpetuated in the church. For when our Lord, in granting His power to the apostles, uttered the words, As the Father hath sent me, I also send you, He could not have had in mind a merely personal favor bestowed upon the apostles. The mission which Christ had received from His Father, and in virtue of which He sent forth His apostles, must bear fruit in the church to the end of time. And the powers conferred in the act of sending them forth must be perpetuated in the apostles' successors. It would seem strange indeed that our Lord should so solemnly assure His apostles that He was now executing the great mission He had received from the Father by conferring a personal privilege which was to last only during the few short years of the apostles' lives. The mission of the apostles was to be the mission of the church, and as the church was to endure to the end of the world, the powers conferred on the apostles must be the lasting possession of the church. We would ask that anyone who holds the power given to the apostles was a personal and exclusive prerogative to consider the practical bearings of such a prerogative. The twelve apostles, let us suppose, possessed the personal privilege of absolving from sin, just as an ecclesiastic of our day may possess certain personal powers received from the Pope during a visit to Rome, powers of which his friends at home, say in America, are glad to avail themselves. A discipline of penance would thus have been established, and although the apostles could not be everywhere, many Christians, thousands no doubt, would seek to obtain the privilege of being absolved by one of the twelve. And just so far as it was a privilege, it is conceivable that God might confer upon the apostles the power to grant it. But is it likely that in so important a matter as the reconciliation of a sinner with God and his eternal salvation, some would be given the peace and security consequent upon this apostolic act and others deprived of it? But what shall we say of the alternative power of retaining or refusing to pardon, which was given the apostles together with that of pardoning? The apostles will be empowered to refuse forgiveness on seeing improper dispositions in the sinner. Is it possible that this element in the discipline of penance was to cease upon the deaths of the apostles? That the rigors of the penitential system were to be held over the heads of obstinate sinners during the lives of the apostles and then suddenly cease? How sinners would rejoice at the disappearance of this last vestige of apostolic power! How helpless would be the poor sinner who should happen to be under the apostolic ban when the last of the apostles died. 4. But the power of forgiving and retaining sins was not to be exercised without any act proceeding from the sinner. Absolution on the part of the priest supposes self-accusation, of course with true sorrow, on the part of the sinner. Let us not forget that the power conferred was twofold. It was not only a power of forgiveness, but also a power of retaining, i.e. refusing to forgive. If the power were only a pardoning power, it is perhaps conceivable that absolution should be granted without confession. The power of forgiving sins might be such that the priest, after exhorting one or more persons to repent in their hearts, might without more ado pronounce a formula of pardon. But the words, whose sins you shall retain, etc., change the whole nature of the case. The priests are evidently constituted judges. They are to decide whether the sinner is worthy of absolution or not. But how can they do so unless they know the state of the sinner's soul, unless they know the specific character of his offenses, the view he takes of them, his resolutions for the future, his willingness to make reparation for the harm done to the person, the character, or property of his neighbor? But all this supposes self-accusation on the part of the sinner. As regards sins committed entirely in the secrecy of the heart, it is plain that the priest can have no inkling of the state of the soul except through a confession of the sinner. 5. But confession is not only a condition for receiving absolution, it is a condition for eternal salvation in regard to grievous sins or sins that cut off one from salvation. In other words, there is a universal obligation of confessing grievous sins. This obligation is implied in the powers granted to the apostles and their successors. A little reflection should suffice to show the absurdity of a situation in which the priests of the church would be equipped with the power of binding and releasing in matters bearing on eternal salvation, while the faithful would have it in their power to evade their jurisdiction. Many would doubtless choose the easier way, and many, still held in their sins by the refusal of the priest to absolve them, 
could and would nullify the action of the priest at pleasure. The binding power conferred on the priests of the church would be rendered perfectly negligatory. Confession must then be an obligation for all or for none. The obligation of confessing has been inculcated and insisted upon in the church from the earliest ages. The records of the councils and the writings of the fathers abound in testimonies to that effect. Among others, St. Basil says, We must confess our sins to those who are appointed the dispensers of the divine mysteries. And St. Augustine, the great doctor of the West, writing as though he were addressing our modern reformers, says to the people of his time, Let no one among you say, I do penance in secret and before God. God who knows that I repent in my heart will forgive me. Was it said to no purpose then, whatsoever you shall loose in earth shall be loosed in heaven? Was it to no purpose that the church received the keys of the kingdom of heaven? Testimonies of the same kind might be multiplied from St. Cyprian, St. Irenaeus, and others. It is only too evident that the Reformers, in their discussions on confession, have confined their attention to the absolving power and have shut their eyes to the binding power. The absolving power they have either diluted or reasoned away except when they have regarded it as a personal prerogative of the apostles. The power of binding is an idea that has not fructified in their minds. It would seem to be a seed dropped in uncongenial soil, whereas in the Catholic Church, both ideas have germinated to the full in a penitential practice that has been handed down through the ages.